Okay, last uh, sound check. Hal, are you there? Yes. Paul, are you there? Yes. Peter, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. All right, so uh, let's give it a start. People will join us um, as uh, they come online. That's not a problem. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be starting the uh, session uh, in about a minute. My name is Joseph Galley, and I'm the co-founder and director of the Louise Deed Sound uh, Syndrome Foundation of Canada and a director of the U.S. Foundation as well. This is a joint initiative of both the foundations in Canada and the U.S., and I'd like to welcome uh, my partner, Gretchen Oswald, who sits on the board in Canada and is the president of the U.S. Foundation, and she's sitting next to Dr. Dietz right now, uh, encouraging him. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. Peter Armstrong for his openness and interest in um, holding this webinar event and, and giving us one of his management meetings. We met at POSNA earlier this year, and Peter was re very receptive to learning about Lois Dietz syndrome. We had numerous discussions over the summer and concluded that Shriners is in a unique position as your organization sees thousands of patients a year who have the disease and because of the muscle skeletal and, and related type of features. We've undertaken a multi-pronged strategy to create awareness, foster research, and provide support for patients, families, and the medical community. In this light, the pediatric orthopedic, uh, orthopedic community is considered for us to be the tip of the spear in identifying Louis Deeds patients. Uh, as we'll see tonight, many of the LDS patients have muscle skeletal conditions that orthopods see and are not aware of. So tonight our objective is to provide you with information on Lois Dietz so that you can help identify patients with this rare but deadly disease. Uh, I'd like to say that not only does the Shriners do fantastic orthopedic and burn work, uh, but we uh, now you'll be able to help us contribute to saving the lives of patients with LDS by identifying them early and with correct diagnosis. And prior to putting together our strategic plan earlier this year, we interviewed 40 of the top uh, researchers, doctors, um, people with the disease, families, and uh, parents of uh, children that have passed away from the disease. And it was very clear that the one thing that we could do that would have a major impact on this community was early and correct diagnosis. And that's, that's what our objective is. And that's where we see working together with your institution as being a, a key contributing factor to this. Uh, this is personal for me as my wife and two of my sons have Louis uh, they're treated in Montreal at the Shriners. We consider ourselves extremely fortunate to have the great care that we have, uh, and that's what's led us to uh, developing a relationship, which we'll perhaps talk about a little bit later on. Shortly, I'll pass the mic to Dr. Armstrong, who will open up the session. Then uh, Dr. Hal Dietz will give us his presentation, which should last about 20, 25 minutes. Then we'll move on to Dr. Paul Sponseller for 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer period where um, you'll be able to raise your hand. You'll see a little hand at the bottom of the participant panel. And as you click on that, uh, it'll light up next to your name and it'll put it in sequence of order. And I will be able to um, highlight, to turn your mic on when it's time to ask the questions. The session is being recorded and the recording plus the presentation material will be made available to all attendees after the session. And we'll coordinate that through uh, Dr. Armstrong's office. So um, Peter, uh, is it okay if I turn it over to you to make the introduction? It is. Do I have the the mic? Yep, you're the man. Uh, first of all, uh, just to add a, a little moment of levity to this, I, I would like to personally, on behalf of those of us who live in Tampa, Florida, thank Hal and Paul for what the Baltimore Orioles did last night. <laughs> That put us into the yeah, playoffs. Having having said that, now we'll get serious again. <laughs> as um, as Joseph mentioned, he and I had the opportunity to meet and sit down and uh, talk at uh, Pozna in, in uh, Montreal, and I, I was fascinated to uh, learn about uh, this syndrome. You know, I've been out of clinical practice now for well, this is my my twelfth year, and this is a uh, syndrome that was identified and characterized uh, by uh, HEL, playing a big role in that back in uh, 2005. And as Joseph and I he, uh, spoke, uh, you know, I thought, the, you know, the mission of Shriners Hospitals for Children in, in all that we do is the same as anyone who works in pediatrics, and that's to provide the very best care to the children who come to us. And as uh, Joseph explained it to me, the, the, uh, the challenge 
with this syndrome is that there are a lot of people who don't know about it. Therefore, it, you know, the kids with this condition are misdiagnosed, and that has uh, a potential for significant uh, complications up to and including uh, death. And so I, I really felt that it would be very good if we then did an educational session for our uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists. I noticed Kathy Murray is on. She's uh, one of our radiologists. And to make people aware, now I was I was interested to find out that there are two or three people when when the initial announcement went out uh, wrote back to me and said that they in fact have a patient with uh, Lois Steets uh, syndrome. So we uh, we began the plans to do this uh, seminar, and and I would like to personally yeah, thank uh, Hal Dietz and, and one of our colleagues in the pediatric orthopedic world, Paul Sponsler, for taking the time out of one of their evenings to to educate us on the Lois Dietz syndrome and uh, you know the characteristics, and so that. So the Triners is very knowledgeable, and we will not be included in, in the group that misdiagnoses this syndrome. I'm excited about it, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our honored guests. So I'll turn it back to you, Joseph. Thank you very much, Peter. Appreciate it. So our first speaker, Dr. Hal Dietz, is the Victor A. McCusick Professor of Genetics and Medicine Investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's got a BA from Duke a medical degree from SUNY Upstate Medical Center. He did his residency in pediatrics, a fellowship in cardiology, and a postdoc all at Johns Hopkins. Um, Dr. Dietz was recently voted to the National Academy of Sciences, and as the name, and I'm not sure how it got to be Lois Dietz as opposed to Dietz Lois, maybe Hal will share that with us afterwards, um, uh, co-discovered the genes related to LDS with Dr. Bart Lois, who's now at the University of Antwerp. Uh, most of all, Hal's a terrific guy. He's got a big heart, uh, and he's very focused on the kids, and he's a great supporter of the foundation. We really appreciate that. So thank you very much for taking the time tonight, Hal, as well as the practice sessions and putting up with me as I tried to get all of this organized. So, Hal, I'm going to switch the ball over to you now. And, okay, Jim. Uh, that way you can uh, lead us from here. All right. Um, can you help me get to my slide presentation? All right, Hal, so are you, um, do you have sharing? And we're going to look at, uh, you're, you're now the um, presenter. So it's still showing the intro slide. Yeah. Um, that's only, be, so can you go and do share application? I'm sorry, everyone. I'm trying. Just one moment. You're good, Hal. You're on your way. The screen is changing. And we have your slide up and ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, taking time out of their busy schedules to join us to learn more about um, Lois Deed syndrome. Uh, as Joe and Peter mentioned, uh, one of our primary goals tonight is to increase uh, awareness and early recognition um, of this condition. Um, I'm going to start um, by giving a brief background about a related disorder called Marfan syndrome, um, and the relevance of that information will become apparent shortly. Um, so as all of you know, uh, Marfan syndrome is a systemic connective tissue disorder with cardinal features in the ocular skeletal and cardiovascular systems, including dislocation of the ocular lens uh, shown on the left, uh, long bone overgrowth, uh, but most importantly, progressive dilatation of the root of the aorta at the level of the sinuses of Alsalva that will lead to aortic tear, rupture, and early death if left untreated. The panel on the left uh, shows what we knew about the cause of Marfan syndrome prior to 1990. Uh, it's an elastin stain of the medial layer of the aorta, showing long, parallel, densely packed elastic fibers in the normal sample on the top, 
uh, with fragmentation and disarray of elastic fibers in someone with Marfan syndrome. In 1991, we were able to show that mutations causing Marfan syndrome occur in the gene that encodes the connective tissue protein fibrillin-1. We learned that fibrillin-1 molecules aggregate to form complex extracellular structures uh, called microfibrils, and that microfibrils cluster around the maturing ends of an elastic fiber during embryonic growth. This simple spatial and temporal relationship led to the firm belief that you need a lattice of microfibrils to form an elastic fiber during embryogenesis. And this, this was really a very pessimistic view. It suggested that a child with Marfan syndrome is born with inadequate elastic fibers and that they all, therefore have an obligate structural predisposition for the tissues to fail later in life, that there's nothing you could do after birth. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a, a molecular pathway, and uh, I, I will uh, be brief with this, but uh, it really highlight, highlights the potential uh, for new and exciting therapeutic strategies uh, for a Marfan syndrome, and I'll, as I'll explain later, for Lowy's Dietz syndrome. So we learned that uh, microfiber. Can you see my cursor as I move it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we learned that microfibrils uh, that are composed of fibrillin one serve an important regulatory function in that they bind the inactive complex of a growth factor molecule that's called transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta. Uh, we also learned that in Marfan syndrome, where you have a deficiency of microfibrils, there's inadequate matrix sequestration of TGF beta, uh, and that this leads to promiscuous activation of the growth factor. That can then go on to uh, set in motion an intracellular signaling cascade that ultimately results in accumulation of a molecule called phosphorylated SMAD2 or SMAD3 in the nucleus. And most importantly, this excessive TGF beta activity had phenotypic consequences. It resulted in the emphysema seen in Marfan syndrome, the mitral valve disease, the aortic aneurysm, and also skeletal muscle myopathy. And we knew this because all of these phenotypic features could be greatly attenuated or even prevented in Marfan mouse models simply by injecting them with TGF beta blocking antibodies. Uh, we then went on to ask whether there was a drug that might mimic this protective effect. And our attention turned to the angiotensin receptor blocker Lozartan that lowers blood pressure, something we think is good for people with aneurysm, but had also been shown to block this TGF beta molecule in rodent models of chronic kidney disease. We went on to uh, treat our Marfan mice with Lozartan shown in the bottom panels. And we learned that um, this treatment resulted in full normalization of the architecture of the vessel wall a full normalization in aortic size, a prevention of pulmonary emphysema, and also normalization of skeletal muscle architecture, fiber number, size, and strength. So uh, there are now large multicenter clinical trials of Lozartan in Marfan syndrome in people mm -hmm. that are going on worldwide. So about um, Six years ago now, my colleague uh, Bart Lowys and I recognized and described a new aortic aneurysm syndrome that had many features like Marfan syndrome, including curvature of the spine, pectus deformity, arachnodactyly, and aortic root aneurysm, but also uh, that included many unique features, including widely spaced eyes, a cleft palate and or a bifid uvula, craniosynostosis, club foot deformity, 
and multiple forms of congenital heart disease, such as patent ductus arteriosus, bicuspid aortic valve, or atrial septal defect. Most importantly, these individuals have diffuse tortuosity of their blood vessels. Uh, on the left, you can see the aorta is making a hairpin turn behind the heart, and the carotid arteries are making pigtail turns as they go up into the head. These patients also de develop aneurysms throughout the arterial tree, not just at the aortic root, but at many sites throughout the body. Importantly, these aneurysms tend to rupture at young ages and at small dimensions when compared to Marfan syndrome. Uh, to date, we have personally cared for over 200 families uh, with this condition that's referred to as Loewy's Dietz syndrome. Now, based upon what we learned about Marfan syndrome, we thought that Loewy's Dietz syndrome would also relate to an abnormality in TGF beta activity. And indeed, the very first two genes we sequenced were the two genes that encode the receptor that sits on the cell surface and that binds to TGF beta. We now learn that the vast majority of patients with Loewy's Dietz syndrome, greater than 95%, have mutations in either of one of these two genes. Uh, by mechanisms that we still don't fully understand, these mutations lead to an increased level of activity of TGF beta in the aorta and in other tissues. On the right, I'm showing you aortic tissue from a control individual and from someone uh, who had surgery for Loewy's Dietz syndrome. We're looking at uh, phosphorylated SMAD2, which shows up as the brown stain. And if you look at the uh, magnified insets, you can see that there's a great increase in the patient with Loewy's Dietz syndrome compared to the control. Um, I think it's uh, very important to review uh, the outward features of Loewy's Dietz syndrome uh, that would allow orthopedists and other specialists to uh, identify individuals that uh, are likely to have this condition or that at least warrant molecular testing. Uh, only about 12% of patients have craniosynostosis. Uh, about 60% have hypertelorism and 22% have cleft palate, uh, which could either be a total cleft or a submucosal cleft. We, uh, interestingly, uh, I think uh, the lack of uh, a cleft lip is a specific feature of Loewy's Dietz syndrome. We have never seen a patient with Loewy's Dietz syndrome that has cleft lip. Uh, these patients have a variety of abnormalities of their uvula. Uh, ranging from a complete bifid uvula to a broad uvula, um, uvula with a midline raphe, or even an especially long uvula. Um, exotropia is uh, common in these patients, uh, as is a blue or dusky appearance to the sclerae. On the top here, I'm showing you a patient with uh, very typical severe craniofacial features of Loewy's Dietz syndrome, but I want to stress that this is not a uniform finding. Uh, for example, the young lady shown in the bottom um, also has a Loewy's Dietz syndrome mutation, um, but has none of the craniofacial features. Uh, she does have arterial tortuosity and mild aortic enlargement at this age. And uh, this has led to two different designations, Loewy's Dietz syndrome 1 with severe craniofacial features and Loewy's Dietz syndrome 2 uh, without the cre a severe craniofacial findings. Um, there are a number of findings that are often quite evident, especially in young children. Um, you can uh, notice in the top panels uh, that these children do have a blue or dusky appearance to the sclera of the eye. And uh, the uh, appreciation of this vein crossing the nasal bridge is often a, a very uh, striking finding, uh, especially in young patients. Um, on the bottom, I'm um, also demonstrating that uh, is, uh, exotropia is also quite common in this population. Um, as I mentioned, uvulas come in very, uh, many flavors, uh, ranging from a simple broad uvula on the upper left 
an even broader uvula in the next image, a uvula with a midline raphe uh, with a minor distal split uh, ranging all the way to uh, uh, an apparent uh, double uvula that's seen in the lower right. Um, Paul uh, Sponseller, my uh, friend and colleague, is going to go over the skeletal features in a lot of detail. Uh, I'll just cover them briefly here. Uh, certainly, as in Marfan syndrome, pectus deformity is quite common, um, most often uh, excavatum, but uh, carinatum is uh, also seen. Uh, scoliosis is common uh, on, and often does require surgical management. Um, and most patients with Lowy's Dietz syndrome have significant joint laxity. Interestingly, uh, unlike Marfan syndrome, many patients with Lowy's Dietz syndrome are not particularly tall and are not taller than their unaffected family members. Um, the uh, mean uh, arm span to height ratio was, uh, is 1.03, which would be perfectly normal. Whereas in people with Marfan syndrome, this ratio would typically be greater than 1.05. Um, the upper to lower segment ratio is also normal in this population with the mean being 0 0.9. So uh, only about 21% of people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome show evidence of long bone overgrowth or do dolichostenomelia. And if they do show it, it tends to be mild. Uh, versus the majority of uh, individuals with Marfan syndrome. As I mentioned, the patients are not particularly tall. Uh, their height Z-score is about 0 0.5 uh, versus uh, 2.0 for Marfan syndrome, so uh, uh, well within the normal height distribution. Um, we often see uh, arachnidactyly um, joint contractures, I believe, are more common in this condition than in Marfan syndrome, although contracture can be seen even in Marfan syndrome, especially in very severely affected young children. About 34% uh, of individuals with Lowy's Dietz syndrome have a personal history of club foot deformity. Uh, this is not always uh, fully penetrant within families, so uh, you know often we'll be seeing a mildly affected individual, uh, but here that multiple relatives uh, have club foot deformity, and and even in those that don't have a clear club foot deformity, uh, forefoot varus uh, is quite a common finding, as is uh, simple pes planus. Uh, many of these patients have significant cervical spine malformation or instability, about 40%. Um, we've identified this in all age groups, and uh, this often does warrant surgical stabilization. Uh, such stabilization can be complicated by poor bone healing, uh, requiring prolonged halo use, for example. And this is particularly common in people with a history of osteoporosis and pathologic fracture, uh, which is uh, a manifestation of Lowy's Dietz syndrome. Uh, so uh, we believe that the initial evaluation, the diagnostic evaluation, should include flexion and extension neck films uh, and a DEXA scan. The uh, skin is uh, generally involved in Lowy's Dietz syndrome, um, often having a thin and translucent uh, quality with easily visible underlying veins, as shown in the lower right. The skin often has a smooth, uh, velvety texture. Uh, most patients describe a tendency for easy bruising um, or dystrophic scar formation, um, as shown on the upper right. About, a half, uh, about half of patients have a history of hernia, and uh, about 60% have dural ectasia. So uh, dural ectasia is a, about as common uh, in Lowy's Dietz syndrome um, as it is in Marfan syndrome. As I mentioned, arterial tortuosity is common. In, in fact, we think this is a very useful diagnostic finding. Uh, and we would all, all often do a three-dimensional CT or MR angiogram uh, in a diagnostic evaluation. Um, it's seen in about 92% of patients and most often is uh, prominent in the head and neck vessels, uh, particularly the involvement of the carotids and vertebrals uh, are often seen. 
Uh, the uh, ascending aorta and aortic arch in the lower uh, aorta and branch vessels uh, can also show tortuosity. Uh, we don't know that tortuosity is clearly indicative of a problematic vessel. Um, it's so common that uh, we don't think that it has great prognostic significance in this patient group, although we have seen unexplained stroke uh, in two patients. Um, aneurysm is, uh, as I mentioned, very common, uh, widely distributed, and uh, often very early in this disorder. Um, at the time of diagnosis, close to 97, 90 percent of patients have aortic root aneurysms. Uh, 27 percent would have involvement of the more distal ascending aorta, which is not typical of Marfan syndrome. Uh, the aortic arch uh, and the descending thoracic and abdominal aorta uh, can be involved. Uh, about a third of patients have vessel involvement beyond the aorta. Uh, so we do believe that uh, uh, there should be uh, a, a MRA or CTA from the head through the pelvis at the time of diagnosis. Uh, we would repeat this about every uh, 18 months and uh, make particular use of MRA studies on a regular basis uh, in order to avoid radiation exposure, uh, but prefer CTA of the head um, because of a lower rate of false positive calls by CTA as compared to MRA uh, for uh, evaluation of the head. Um, we would certainly uh, in, uh, do more frequent evaluations if there's a particular vas vascular issue uh, that's being followed. Um, as I mentioned, other cardiovascular findings include patent ductus, atrial septal defect, bicuspid aortic valve, and mitral valve prolapse. Um, the uh, aortic root is uh, often very enlarged, especially in young children who are already uh, requiring attention uh, and not simply because of a positive family history. Young children that make themselves obvious to us at an early age tend to have more severe vascular disease, so their vascular involvement parallels their systemic involvement. Uh, we do recommend an echocardiogram at least once a year for these patients. Aortic dissection can also be an early presenting finding. It's present at diagnosis in about a third of patients uh, with a mean age of 24 years and a range of six months to 44 years. Uh, the, uh, there appears to be a slightly higher tendency for early dissection in male patients, um, as is seen in many vascular conditions. And again, the, the dissection most commonly involves the root, uh, but also can involve other aortic segments. So uh, mean age of elective repair in uh, these patients is 19 years. Um, mean age of more distal aortic arch repair is 30 years, um, and uh, for descending thoracic aortic repair is 25 years. Um, fortunately, uh, these patients have shown a, a truly phenomenal response to cardiovascular surgery. Uh, initially, when we first recognized these conditions, uh, this condition, we worried that these patients might behave similarly to individuals with vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who have a very high rate of operative complications. Uh, but uh, now having done um, uh, over 100 uh, prophylactic vascular procedures in this patient group, uh, we've seen zero uh, in-hospital deaths for elective root repairs, uh, zero late deaths for elective repairs, and uh, one total operative death, um, that was a very complex uh, redo arch repair. So uh, we've continued to try to use mouse models of vascular conditions uh, to explore new therapeutic strategies. And uh, we've now gone on to introduce specific uh, disease-associated Lowy's Dietz syndrome mutations into mice in, in both the type 1 and type 2 receptor subunit. As you can see on the bottom, uh, Lowy's Dietz syndrome mice have much larger aortic root sizes when compared to their normal or wild-type litter mates, shown in blue. 
um, and that Loewy's Dietz syndrome mice show a significant reduction in aortic root size and aortic root growth rate uh, when treated with Lozartan. So we do think that this therapy that has been uh, pioneered for Marfan syndrome will show relevance to this patient population. Uh, fortunately, the Lowe's Deed syndrome mice nicely recapitulate nearly all aspects of the disease, uh, including the skeletal phenotype. Um, as you can see, when compared to a normal or wild type mouse, uh, the mouse line with a mutation in the, in the uh, type 1 receptor subunit or the type 2 receptor subunit uh, shows significant kyphosis um, and also show overgrowth of the ribs. Uh, so we do think that these mice can be used to explore the driving mechanisms in orthopedic disease in this condition and also will be useful to explore potential medical therapies. Um, we don't yet know whether some of the therapies that have been developed for Marathan syndrome uh, will influence uh, the skeletal system. Uh, but uh, we have more experience with the Marfan mouse model. Um, here again, I'm showing you a normal mouse on the top and a Marfan mouse on the bottom. And you can see, uh, once again, this very prominent kyphosis um, and rib overgrowth. Uh, we recently went on to uh, treat these mice uh, with Lozartan. Uh, this is an intermediate result. Uh, they will be treated for a longer period of time. Um, but we do uh, uh, actually see some subtle evidence of, uh, of a uh, reduction in the uh, kyphotic curve, and this does correlate with a significant reduction in total spine length in these mice. So at least the hint that there might be medical strategies that could be used uh, to manage orthopedic issues. So uh, medical management of vascular disease uh, in Lowy's Dietz syndrome, it's now wide uh, practice to use Lozartan because it's uh, FDA approved and uh, very well tolerated for other indications. Importantly, this medication is not simply being used to lower blood pressure. So you really have to use aggressive dosing uh, to hope to achieve a reduction in TGF beta activity. These patients uh, should have exercise restrictions with specific avoidance of contact sports, competitive sports to the point of exhaustion, and isometric exercise uh, that involves muscle straining, uh, but should remain active with aerobic activities that are performed in moderation. And again, we do believe that there should be frequent and widespread uh, spread cardiovascular imaging. Surgical management of the aortic root, um, we uh, now have excellent success with a valve sparing aortic root replacement, allowing these patients to avoid chronic anticoagulation. In patients that have the most severe presentation at the young, at very young ages with severe craniofacial manifestations or with known mutations that are associated with very severe disease, we move ahead with surgery simply when the aortic annulus is big enough to accommodate a graft of sufficient size to take that child through growth. So we're really not following the aortic root size, but rather waiting until the aortic valve is, about, uh, is at least two centimeters in diameter that allows a placement of a good size graft. In patients with a more run-of-the-mill Lowy's deep syndrome, or if pregnancy is anticipated, uh, we would do uh, root surgery at about 4.0 uh, 4 centimeters. And in patients who are least predisposed based upon subtle systemic manifestations, family history of mild disease, or mutations that are known to be associated with more mild disease, we would do aortic root surgery at about 4.5 centimeters. Uh, surgical management of other vascular issues really depends upon the site, uh, the nature of the lesion, and its accessibility. In general, when compared to the uh, general population with similar vascular lesions, we would use a more aggressive approach in this patient population, and both, both operative and intravascular approaches are considered. 
Uh, we do know that pregnancy is a risky proposition in women with Low East Dietz syndrome. In a very early experience, uh, we assessed 21 pregnancies in 12 women. Uh, six had major complications during pregnancy or postpartum. That included four aortic dissections or two uterine ruptures. And uh, there were also three individuals who had uterine hemorrhage that required surgical management independent of pregnancy. Uh, this clearly needs to uh, have further study, but if a woman with Low East Dietz syndrome does make the decision to become pregnant, uh, we would recommend an echocardiogram every two to three months. We would recommend that that woman be followed by a high-risk obstetrician. Um, and uh, we would also uh, need to take her off an angiotensin receptor blocker such as Lozartan for the duration of the pregnancy because they can have, uh, the, such medications can have teratogenic effects. Uh, interestingly, there are some other systemic manifestations that can provide a clue to, uh, you know, a patient that has Low East Dietz syndrome. We've recently recognized a very high prevalence of allergic disease in this patient population. For example, uh, patients with Low East Dietz syndrome, about 48% of them have seasonal allergy or allergic rhinitis. Nearly half have medically uh, managed asthma. About 40% have eczema. 30% have food allergies that tend to be multiple and severe, often requiring uh, use of an EpiPen. And about 10% of them have eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, or even a picture most consistent with inflammatory bowel disease. And if you look on the right, uh, this represents tremendous enrichment in Low East Dietz patients compared to the general population. Uh, we are currently doing work to uh, better understand this predisposition, uh, but it's now clear that there is altered maturation of the immune system, uh, promoting a, a very pro-inflammatory uh, predisposition in these patients. Uh, fortunately, our Low East Dietz syndrome mice uh, do spontaneously develop these allergic phenotypes. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, this very inflamed esophagus in a mouse with Low East Dietz syndrome compared to its normal litter mate. And on the right, I'm showing you that this uh, inflammation is uh, characterized by intense inf in, uh, infiltration of eosinophils. So we really do think that uh, the Low East Dietz mouse model is not going to only be informative about uh, the pathogenesis and treatment of vascular disease, but will also inform uh, the management of other systems. There are a few uh, um, other manifestations of Low East Dietz syndrome that need to be considered. Um, many of the severe uh, young children have dental anomalies, including enamel hypoplasia with uh, severe tooth decay uh, and delayed tooth eruption. A headache is much more frequent in Low East Dietz syndrome than it is in the general uh, population. It tends to have a vascular quality, uh, a migraine type history, um, and it's very important to counsel these patients to avoid vasoconstrictors such as triptan medications. Uh, we now have a number of examples where patients with Low East Dietz syndrome have suffered vascular dissection and death uh, in association with the use of triptans for headache management. Uh, seizure is a rare manifestation of Low East Dietz syndrome. Um, it certainly deserves a full neurologic workup when it's seen. Initial reports suggested that learning problems uh, were seen in about 15% of people with Low East Dietz syndrome, but this is now obviously an overestimate uh, now that we've seen a broader spectrum of this condition. And when seen, it's largely secondary to hydrocephalus or other definable causes. And about 6% uh, of patients have uh, symptomatic Chiari malformation. So summary of uh, Low East Dietz syndrome specific management, maintain a high index of suspicion, uh, including any patient with atypical findings uh, in Marfan syndrome or other vascular conditions. Play, uh, pay close attention to even subtle craniofacial, skin, orthopedic, and imaging findings, uh, and when in doubt, uh, sequence the genes. It's a very 
sensitive and specific test. The uh, diagnostic evaluation should include uh, three-dimensional imaging from the head to the pelvis and uh, certainly imaging of the cervical spine. Uh, you need to question and counsel patients regarding a risk of severe allergic reactions and uh, there should be more aggressive medical and surgical, surgical management of cardiovascular disease. Um, I'd like to leave you with a sense of the wide variation in facial appearance of patients with Low ESD syndrome. You know, if you only uh, paid attention to children who had very obvious outward facial features, uh, then you would miss uh, other individuals uh, who uh, have more subtle manifestations in the uh, or outward manifestations, but may have just as severe cardiovascular manifestations that require aggressive management. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, both my research team um, and uh, our clinical team and uh, really give a, a, a huge debt of gratitude uh, to Paul Sponseller for the truly fantastic orthopedic service that he provides to Lowy's Deep Syndrome patients and all other connective tissue populations. Um, and to Gretchen Oswald, who is uh, the genetic counselor that works in our clinic, truly a world's expert in Lowy's Deep Syndrome and co-founder of the Lowy's Deep Syndrome Foundation in the U.S. Um, I think uh, the plan was to take questions after both presentations, but I, I certainly will be eager to uh, address any questions that you have. Uh, thank you for your attention. Al, thank you very much. That's terrific. Um, very informative as usual. So we'll move on to our second speaker, which is Dr. Paul Sponseller. He's well known within the orthopedic community. Uh, he's the Department Executive Vice Chair of Orthopedic Surgery and Chief Division of Pediatric Orthopedics at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Sponseller has a medical degree from the University of Michigan. He completed his residency at the University of Wisconsin. He completed orthopedic and pediatric spine fellowships at Harvard. He also has a Master of Science in Business and Medicine and an MBA at Johns Hopkins. I'm not sure how your business card is big enough, uh, Paul, to put all of those degrees on it. Uh, for anyone who participated at POSNA this year, you know, um, you know, you can attest that Paul has been very generous with his time and supporting us uh, and getting this uh, message out, and he's been a great supporter of the foundation as well. So thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to I'm going to pass the ball over to you now, and make you the presenter. So um, we are doing that right now. And uh, I see that you have your presentation there. You can go to full screen and you can start when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good. So this is uh, the orthopedic part of the recognition. And I'd like to again uh, acknowledge in pictorial form uh, Lois Dietz syndrome. There's Bart Lois and Hal Dietz, who, as you heard, uh, they find the gene for Marfan and then went in to recognize this uh, form of it. I'd like to talk about how it affects the bones, how we can recognize it, and what we have so far in musculoskeletal experience for the hands, the spine, and other parts. First, starting with the ultrastructure, uh, we have become aware that bone density and bone quality is impaired in Marfan syndrome, and we have uh, several specimens of iliac crest bone that we have done 3D micro CT analysis of in humans, comparing normal on the left to Lowy Steet syndrome on the right. And you can see an obvious difference. Looking at that qualitatively in our lab, uh, you can see there's decreased bone volume over total volume, trabecular number, thickness, spacing, and connectivity. Looking at the histology, uh, there's also a visible difference in how the osteoblasts and osteoclasts relate to uh, the matrix. On a non-LDS patient on the left, you can see osteoblasts with the asterisks and osteoclasts with the blue arrows in close proximity, whereas in the lois dietz syndrome, you don't see that juxtaposition. and Instead, you see this more homogeneous uh, mixture of fibrocytes-like cells opposed to the bone both in the uh, high power and the low power views here. So the way that the, uh, the uh, extracellular matrix uh, uh, relates to the bone herbeculae is different, and we have a lot of further work to do on that subject. Looking at a mouse model on micro CT, you can also see a greater degree of porosity of the cortex, again, 
with Lois Dietz mice being on the right, generously provided by Hal's lab. And uh, we are defining the biomechanical properties uh, and the cellular signaling abnormalities that are taking place to cause this difference in structure, with remodeling, and connectivity with the hypothesis that the, <coughs> the, uh, there is uncoupling of bone formation and uh, resorption uh, to lead to decreased remodeling and decreased uh, mechanical properties of this bone. As Hal has just mentioned, clinically there's a typical triad of arterial abnormalities, hypertelorism, the bifid midline structures, and bone joint and muscle findings are extremely variable from patient to patient. The skeleton really represents the best opportunity for recognition of the disorder. You can't see the aorta, you can't see these vessels dilated, but you can see these skeletal findings, and that should alert, in many cases, the diagnostician to be able to recognize these patients for proper vascular and cardiovascular management and counseling. The ligamentous laxity, as you can see here in the knees, is often quite striking and evident elsewhere. Working closely with Hal's group, we had the unique opportunity to study uh, a snapshot of these patients, and this was recently published. Looking at 65 patients, we found, as Hal said, a less uh, impressive degree of arachnodactyly. We found that many of these patients, almost a quarter of them, had been previously diagnosed as Marfan syndrome, a smaller number as Ehlers-Danlos, uh, Sprintz and Goldberg syndrome, and uh, many of these have a, a fairly strong family history of either recognized LDS or aneurysms. In the upper extremity, they do have long, narrow fingers, and often a positive thumb sign is shown here on the left or wrist sign on the right. But they also have contractures in many cases uh, of the lesser digits, especially the ulnar digits, but sometimes the thumb and metacarpal phalangeal joints, uh, and it's very variable even from right to left side. In the hip, uh, there was a small number who had DDH. Uh, one adult patient had AVN requiring total hip replacement. And protrusion is seen in about a third of patients, usually mild. We don't think that that seems to result in premature degeneration the way it does sometimes in Marfan. We had one patient who had a fairly striking progression of her acetabular development between the ages of three and seven years. And you can see the narrowing of the teardrop and obvious uh, protrusion and deepening of the acetabular sockets, uh, again, showing the, high, the suspicion of uh, increased remodeling and perhaps pressure sensitivity of the bone in this high stress area. And I think the mechanisms for this will be very interesting when we finally understand uh, what's causing this. Knee problems can include not only hyperextensibility, but often varus valgus. And in some mild cases, growth guidance may be appropriate, uh, as you can see here, done with uh, eight plates with the hemiopathesis effect. There's often medial lateral laxity in the collaterals, uh, severe hyperextension and recurvatum, as you can see here, and weakness of the muscles. If the foot is also uh, lax and weak, uh, this makes the knee problem even more uh, severe and important. Tre treatment may include bracing, if it's feasible, and occasionally correction of major malalignments through bony osteotomies. Hindfoot valgus is often seen in these patients either spontaneously or after clubfoot releases. Most patients have some degree of a flat foot, and uh, about a fifth have clubfoot, either unilateral or bilateral. We don't know why a small fraction of kids gets this severe foot deformity and why you have contractures and laxity coexisting in the same disorder. It may have to do with inflammation and repair of tendons and ligaments, uh, but I think this will be a very interesting point to understand in the connective tissue world. Our usual approach to club foot in Lois Dietz is the same as in other conditions uh, with Ponsetti casting. Uh, the success rate seems to be reasonable. Eight out of the 11 patients that were studied in our series did have a good response to Ponsetti casting, albeit with some res residual adduction or hind foot varus, but a plantigrade and functional foot. 
the few patients that underwent surgery seem to develop a major degree of overcorrection, often going into valgus or skew foot, as you can see here. Again, illustrating uh, the laxity being unmasked by this surgery. Most patients with Loeys Dietz syndrome have some degree of metatarsis adductus. Uh, treatment is either just observe or stretching. Uh, it's rare that we have had to do any osteotomies in this population. A number will go on to the severe deformity of skew foot, which is a forefoot adduction with severe hind foot valgus. Some of these result again from uh, a zealous club foot surgery, but some are spontaneous. Most of them are treated observantly uh, because they have a fairly daunting prognosis, but in some cases, a combined uh, lateral shortening and medial lengthening can be helpful in improving their plantigrade nature. For the general flat foot that most patients have, my preference uh, is not to use prophylactic orthotics unless the patient's having pain and maldistribution of pressure, in which case common sense can guide the use of an orthotic. There's a limited role for symptomatic surgery because, as we've seen both in Marfan syndrome and in Lois Dietz syndrome, transfer to another portion of the foot will often occur from correction of the uh, foot, and uh, you really can't uh, get a predictable result from ligamentous surgery or capsulotomies. One fairly safe option for the hind foot valgus is to do a calcaneal osteotomy, redistributing the collapsing stress without uh, performing a capsulotomy. And this can be done even in patients with osteoporosis and get a satisfactory result. As Hal said, many patients will have ingoing sternum or pectus carinatum. More common, however, is pectus excavatum. And in our series, uh, a small number had surgical correction most, however, uh, were preoccupied with their more uh, severe cardiovascular problems. The spine is where it becomes uh, even more interesting because these patients have problems all the way up and down the spine. One of the most striking features of the syndrome is congenital cervical abnormalities and instability, including formation defects, instability, or both. In the cervical spine, you see things uh, that correspond to the bifid uvula and the sutural abnormalities at the cervical, upper cervical spine level. They often have formation defects in the anterior arch or the posterior arch, as you can see here. Some of them have just a curious off-center position of the odontoid within the arch of C1, which is not really a problem, but again, illustrates the, uh, the midline formation and symmetry defects that these patients have at this level of the skeleton. In the series I mentioned, um, a number had C1, C2 subluxation, either front to back or rotatory. Um, we also had some with uh, abnormal stenosis at C1, laxity at C2, 3, which we know is a predisposed area to this problem. And uh, many of these patients have come on to surgery. In the thoracolumbar spine, the results of bracing are not known, but in most syndromes, bracing does not stop progression. It may slow it if started early enough. We do know that in Marfan syndrome, there's evidence that it works much less well than in idiopathic scoliosis, and we use it early, if at all, and not for some of the more severe cases when the curves are 40 and 45 degrees. Scoliosis in the thoracic and lumbar spine was seen in more than half of the patients. Uh, most of them in the braceable or surgical range. Three patients in this series had posterior spine fusion, and uh, we have to be careful, just as in Marfan syndrome, for junctional problems and adding on problems. I've illustrated a sequence here in a patient that I took care of. She had a surgical scoliosis, which we treated, and subsequently went on to a proximal junctional kyphosis, requiring a cervical to lower uh, an occipital to lower lumbar fusion, as you can see here. Um, so the stress concentration between her previously fused upper cervical spine and the newly fused thoracolumbar spine pre precipitated this junctional instability. We also have three patients who are being treated with growing rods, and that seems to be a useful strategy. And uh, so far, we haven't had any notable complications with this treatment, uh, either upper thoracic to lower lumbar or sometimes to the pelvis. 
Later on in life, you can see uh, other problems such as premature lumbar degeneration and duralectasia at all ages in about two-thirds of the patients. They really have panspinal pathology, and in some cases we see spondylolisthesis developing at a fairly early age, such as this patient here who started with a grade uh, four, three spondylo at age four and went on rapidly to a grade four or five uh, spondylolisthesis. This patient underwent a posterior fusion elsewhere, but she developed instability at, at uh, S1, S2 with plowing at the screws and required uh, augmentation. Because of the scoliosis, she also had a growing rod inserted at the same time, and she required two revisions, first an L5 decancellation, and then when that didn't unite, a Bowman procedure to help achieve stability at this level. Another illustration of the panspinal pathology is this patient who had an extensive upper cervical instability requiring fusion elsewhere, but developed severe junctional instability with critical respiratory distress, possibly from large airway distortion. And uh, he actually had his kyphoscoliosis treated with growing rods, and he was again stabilized from the occiput down to the sacrum. And his respiratory function improved dramatically, requiring less oxygen. Uh, and no nighttime, uh, no daytime support, uh, and this uh, seems to have been a solution for his uh, his ventilatory problems. Fracture is also seen in these patients, uh, often unusual fracture patterns, such as this woman, girl who came for a routine clinic visit uh, with a, a minimally symptomatic stress fracture of her femoral neck. This has also been reported in another patient. It's probably would be even more evident if these patients were more active, but uh, there is osteopenia and osteoporosis in a moderate number of these patients, which is currently being investigated. So in summary, these patients can be recognized by facial findings uh, with wide spacing of their eyes and of the uvula, and also by some skeletal pairings, such as Marfan-like appearance with club feet, unusual, unusual types of cervical instability with midline defects, and digital contractures. The ligamentous laxity at the knees especially, but also at the feet and elbows, is much more of a problem than seen in Marfan syndrome. And the syndrome is very pleomorphic, with each patient having a totally different constellation of findings from every other patient. The principles I'd like to stress are the importance of ensuring ongoing cardiovascular monitoring uh, in treating a club foot, try to be as conservative as possible with non-operative or minimally operative releases. Anticipate decreased bone quality when performing spine and extremity surgery. Examine the entire spine, including, as Hal said, C-spine flexion extension laterals and looking closely at the lumbosacral joints. And anticipate junctional deformities of the uh, ends of your constructs uh, so that you don't fuse too short and uh, avoid stress concentration. So I'd like to thank the Shriners Hospital System for promoting awareness of this syndrome. And I'd also like to thank them for hosting the recent uh, 2011 Marfan Foundation meeting in the beautiful city of Portland, which is shown here looking out the clinic window at this beautiful landscape. So uh, thanks again, Peter, and thanks for everybody who is listening, and Joe as well. And I guess we will take questions now. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. That's terrific. I appreciate it. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, the attendees you have at the bottom of your screen, so if you click on your uh, participants panel at the bottom of your screen, you have a little hand. And if you click on the hand, it'll indicate, and I'll open your microphone to ask questions. So if uh, anybody's having a hard time to see that, if you just um, scroll to the top of your screen, put your cursor over the little green bar, click on participants, you will then see um, a window open, click at the attendees and you'll see your name. And if you just click the little uh, hand at the bottom of the screen, um, we will then uh, open your microphone so you can ask some questions. So uh, I'll uh, stand by while you are finding the little hand at the bottom of your participant screen. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, go through the different uh, attendees. Andrea, do you have any questions for either of our speakers? Uh, 
Uh, no, thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction um, for those of us who are still learning about it. So appreciate it. Okay, good standby. And I'm going to open up uh, Dr. Jean Wallet's mic. Um, Jean, go ahead, you're live. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. <clears throat> So I guess my question is in respect to uh, sort of a general orthopod or, or going through clinics and we're, I guess, when do you start uh, getting antsy in respect to, do you have a kid that has, a, let's say, a pectus and scoliosis and, and some club feet? Um, they, obviously, you know, the, the spectrum of the clinical presentation seems to be quite uh, wide. Uh, so maybe if you could sort of tell us, um, Dr. Dietz or, uh, or Paul, um, when, you know, what are the key things, uh, you know, so if you see a bifid uvula, then, then, then right off the bat you sort of jump on that, or are there other orthopedic clues that, you know, you sort of put together that brings you a bit of a higher suspicion to either start screening the patients, and that's the first question. I guess if you do, do you send them for a, 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 an echo, uh, send them for MRA, or what are your initial sort of investigation or screening tools? Well, that's a, a very good question. I think clubfoot, when paired with any of the Marfan-like features, um, does have a high chance of being low feet syndrome. In, in my own just general pediatric practice, I've actually come across three clubfoot patients that ended up having LDS, and I referred them to HAL, and it wasn't really coming from HAL to me. It was coming from my general pediatric orthopedic practice to HAL. So I think there's going to be a lot more recognition of this syndrome. And uh, I think clubfoot, when paired with any of the Marfan conditions, uh, probably should be, I'm sorry, Marfan features should be uh, investigated. And uh, as far as the how, how the diagnosis is made, uh, you know, HAL can speak to that, but it's uh, genetically based. Al, would you like to make a comment? Sure, I, I would uh, fully agree with what Paul was saying. Um, even in our clinic, um, when people come to us with uh, vascular issues that are known, um, if we see club foot, then Lowy's Dietz testing is the very first testing that we would perform. Now, bifid uvula is really useful when you see it, um, but uh, again, does not necessarily have to be seen. So if I did see club foot and pectus and um, some soft skin, that would be enough for me to move on to cardiovascular imaging, um, uh, generally echocardiography, uh, as a, an initial uh, clinical screening test. Uh, the uh, vast majority of children, even young children, will have aortic root involvement. Um, but I, you know, again, I would have a very low threshold to send mutation screening of the TGFBR1 and TGFBR2 genes. Uh, this is now available in many commercial labs uh, throughout the country and throughout the, the world. Most of those labs can have an answer back to you within a range of two to six weeks. Uh, so there's pretty quick turnaround. And most often insurance companies will cover this testing. Thank you, Hal. Jean, do you have any other questions uh, before I go on to uh, John's come home? No, that's all right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Jean, uh, so Jean, I'm uh, Jean Wallet. I'm going to um, I'm going to mute your mic and uh, John Scavone, Your mic is now open. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so uh, John Scavone, uh from the uh, Shriners Hospital in. Northern California, and uh, on our call tonight, we have Dr. Uh, Sundeep Tumber, who's one of our staff anesthesiologists and also one of our uh, pediatric anesthesia fellows, uh, Sam Tafoya, who's from UC Davis. And uh, I just want to make a comment, um, just, just a general comment for, for all of the um, uh, cardiologists and for the orthopedists on this call. That is that um, the syndrome is, is a bit under the radar in the anesthesia community. And uh, when we um, did a, a literature search, there was really a, a dearth of information. Um, and so we, we had to um, look at the available medical literature to find out about what this disease uh, precisely was. And we ultimately even uh, were fortunate enough to contact Dr. Geets to, to talk about some of the specifics of the management. Um, I, I, this, this disease is really quite complicated. 
and uh, should be undertaken only with great deliberation by the team, the entire team, orthopedists, the cardiologists, and the anesthesiologists. Um, and I just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you for Thank those you. comments. Thank you very much. Um, is, John, does anybody else in your uh, group uh, have uh, questions or comments? Oh, so uh, I they, see. I see Kerry Milky is logged on, but he doesn't have a phone or a set of headphones beside his name. But Kerry, I, I believe you uh, have or had a patient, and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your comments. Well, Kerry just um, gave us a little icon for raising the hand. Kerry, can you hear us? Kerry, if you would like to type your question in at the uh, in the chat panel, so click on chat, and uh, you will uh, click on send to all participants, and below that, um, you could then type your question in, if that's possible, uh, and then we'll answer you. No, unfortunately, I don't see uh, any uh, typing happening from Kerry. Um, all right. Peter, do you have Kerry's cell number? Do you want to call? I'm, I don't believe I uh, Let me just check and see. All right. In the meantime, while we're waiting to uh, get that resolved, are there other questions? If you mind raising your hand, and if you can't raise your hand for some reason, then uh, you can send me a message through chat. Uh, just type in the box below where it says send to, and I will be uh, happy to uh, turn the mic on. And Paul, I'll ask a question of you. Who, uh, I mean, you, you showed some of the deformities, you showed some of the surgery. Perhaps you could tell us, you know, once the diagnosis is made and once you've made the decision that you're, you're going to do surgery, say, say he, um, you know, the, the spinal deformity correction or something like that. How how do you prepare then for that surgery? What I mean, what is the kind of the lead up so you know as you begin your surgery that that things have been covered and you're fairly comfortable proceeding ahead. Good question, Peter. Um, we generally always like to make sure that the Aortic arch and heart have been recently imaged and followed. We will request a cardiac update if not done within the past six months at the most. Um, sometimes pulmonary in involvement is needed. Um, we will image the area uh, with an MRI to look at dural ectasia in most cases and uh, try to scrutinize the potential anchor points with either good imaging with plain film, sometimes CT scans, so we can be aware of uh, pedicle deformities um, and uh, poor laminar arches. Um, and uh, most of these patients, we will take care of postoperatively in the ICU so they can uh, have proper cardiovascular management for the first night, if not more. The uh, intubation may be slightly compli complicated by neck instability, but in most cases uh, that is uh, either stabilized or something that can be managed by fiber optic intubation. Um, we do find slightly increased bleeding in most of these cases. Uh, we have not experienced anecdotally a high infection rate, really haven't had any infections in this population, so that seems to be uh, not an increased risk. Um, and, uh, you know, those are the, uh, <clears throat> the main things that we uh, take care of. Thank you, Peter. Um, Carrie, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. It's 514-994-7074. Again, 514-994-7074. If you want to call me and I'll ask your question for you because I don't think you have a mic attached or you're not connected. In the meantime, I'm going to go over to John Lawrence. John, I just made your microphone live. Go ahead, please. Uh, can you hear me? This is John Laurent from Los Angeles Shrine. You're on board. Okay. Uh, three questions, and I, again, first apologize. What age are these generally discovered? John, we're losing you. Uh, you're uh, muting in and out. Is there something I can do to improve that? 
Okay, John, we're going to ask you to ask your question again because you muted in and out. Could you ask your question again, please? Uh, it's a three-part question. The first is, uh, at what age are these typically di diagnosed? And I ask that because of the second two parts, which are the treatment if there's a cleft palatal deformity. Do they respond with a standard cleft repair uh, in the same way, or is there other functional disabilities that preclude normal speech? And then the, the third question is related technically, which is if we place these children for a cleft, cleft repair in a high, neck hyperextension, are we putting the child at additional risk that we wouldn't be aware of because they weren't diagnosed early enough? Those are um, excellent questions. Uh, the age of diagnosis is highly variable, uh, ranging from birth to late life. Uh, we've had some people diagnosed at age 70 uh, or 75, but most often in uh, early childhood. Um, cleft repair, my understanding is that very typical practices uh, are used for cleft repair. There's, there's nothing uh, different or special about the repair. Um, we have, unfortunately, heard of a number of circumstances uh, where people have had catastrophic complications um, after uh, neck manipulation in the operating room, um, including paralysis and death. Um, so we do believe that uh, the cervical spine needs to be uh, imaged, understood, and uh, appropriately managed. Uh, before the operation and in the operating room. Well, that, uh, that answers the question is that we would have to have a very high suspicion if the child presents before one year of age, which they typically would, that we wouldn't just march them in and expect them to be positioned normally and do well. Right. The real question is on the follow-up of these cleft repairs, do they, is their functional recovery the same as other children or do they have uh, additional encumbrance because of uh, other factors? No, uh, our experience has been an excellent response to cleft repair without um, residual uh, deformity or deficit. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to mute uh, your uh, microphone. I have um, on my cell phone right now, I've got Carrie on the line. I'm going to uh, put him on the speaker and see if we can uh, allow him to ask his question to Paul. Uh, so, Paul, we'll give it a try and see if uh, you can hear Carrie. Stand by. Can I? Yeah, Carrie, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, the picture I have has really profound skin foot deformity. And I'm wondering if this acts like typical skin foot deformity uh, when, later on. I mean, we think that skin foot deformity has pretty bad. Uh, Natural history. I did. I did continue cuboid canalis osteotomies on mine. It looked like I did nothing. I think part of it is due to the bone density problem. But what's your experience been? Paul, were you able to hear the question? I was. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I think you're right. There's so much ligamentous laxity and muscular hypotonia that that uh, stress redistribution will happen, and uh, I think. You have to look carefully, I guess, at the ankle to make sure there's no valgus of the plafond. Um, and uh, I think the workhorse is uh, doing a hemipiphysis if there is. Uh, calcaneal slide uh, is, is likely to be of some benefit, uh, but I think in general, uh, I'm not sure you can expect a predictable result from uh, uh, just doing hind foot and midfoot osteotomies uh, and getting uh, the degree of correction you would with a non-connected tissue skew foot. And I think prevention is, you know, part of the uh, answer here. And uh, again, a plea for uh, avoiding radical club foot surgery, even though these patients may fail Ponsetti treatment, uh, trying to do the minimum possible to uh, perform a medial release or a posture release uh, and accept a little undercorrection rather than overcorrection, because I think it's uh, more disabling to have a weak overcorrected foot. Thank you, Paul. Carrie, I've still got Carrie on my cell phone. Carrie, do you, are you okay with that? Do you have a follow-up question or comment? All right, Carrie, I'll disconnect with you. Thank you very much for the call-in. All right, so that was uh, Carrie uh, dialing in. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, run through real quick and see if anybody has any questions. Sandeep, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Sarah, any questions? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Raymond, any questions? Raymond, okay. Uh, move on to Philip. Any questions, Philip? Um, I guess just one, just how common is it? Uh, excellent question. Al or uh, Paul, would you like to take a stab at that, please? I wish I had an excellent answer, um, but I don't. Uh, we, um, we've we seen, uh, as I mentioned, about 200 uh, families in our clinic, but that certainly represents uh, a uh, ascertainment bias or a referral bias to our clinic. Um, you know, current uh, estimates for Marfan syndrome are one in 5,000 to one in 10,000. Um, I uh, get the sense that, you know, this might be one in 20,000, um, but uh, that's purely a, a guesstimate at this point. Thank you. Uh, Paul, anything you want to add to that? No, oh, it's a syndrome that's been recognized for less than 10 years, and uh, there are milder as well as more severe phenotypes. So I think many of the uh, more mild patients are not yet recognized, and I think there will be a big wave in recognition uh, in the next decade. Uh, this is Joseph. Uh, as a comment, in Canada, we put a website page up on Yahoo, just a crummy uh, website page in December. And between December and June, we got 40 uh, individuals contacting us saying, where do I get treatment in Canada? To give you guys an idea, if that was the United States, because of the ratio, that would be the equivalent of like 400. So, um, and I've been talking to different clinics, uh, and I found clusters uh, anywhere from 25 to 120 in uh, different clinics outside of uh, Hopkins. So what we, we don't know really what the numbers are, uh, just because it is so new, as Paul was mentioning, and we're still trying to collect the data. And that's part of what the foundation, one of our roles will be, will be to put together a registry and biobank that'll allow us to collect global data uh, on the different patients. All right, thank you very much, Philip. I'll uh, move on to uh, Kathy. Kathy, do you have any questions? No, thank you very much. I thought that was a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Um, and I'm gonna move on to uh, John Lee. Do you have any questions? I know, sir. Uh, it was very informative, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, John Scavone, back to you. Any other questions? No, I, I just, I, I, you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Uh, you, you know, I just um, want to just reiterate a tremendous thank you for, from all of us. Um, I mean, it's, it, it, um, it, it's just an excellent review, and we, we actually consider those of you that are running this thing to be a celebrity in your own right. So we are very, very appreciative of this information. Thank you. We're lucky to have uh, Dr. Sponsor and Dr. Dietz uh, on our team, and they've been terrific. And uh, of course, with Gretchen backing them up. Uh, thank you. Uh, John Warren, anything else? No, thank you very much. A great talk. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean Ouellette, anything else? Oh, to good. I think, um, I guess, from a um, maybe uh, just insight in respect to uh, upcoming research or um, access to uh, patient information and so on. Uh, do either uh, Dr. Sponseller or um, Dr. Dietz, um, you have ongoing projects regarding these, these patients? And if we do come across patients, uh, are you looking for uh, recruitments or stuff? Or? Oh, good question. Al, Paul? So, uh, we certainly have uh, many <clears throat> active clinical research protocols. Um, I think a good point of reference uh, would be the uh, Louis Dietz Syndrome Foundation in Canada and uh, the United States. We usually try to coordinate patient recruitment um, through the foundations. Um, so we, we really appreciate the offer in, in helping with that. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a critical need uh, moving forward to, to fully define the natural history of this disease. Thank you. Paul? And orthopedically, uh, we have some registries looking at the prevalence and importance, especially of the cervical spine abnormalities, which are probably the most unique features of this disease. The thoracic and lumbar treatments are somewhat well known from Marfan work, but the cervical spine is kind of a, a new part of the ball game. So we're trying to look at the prevalence and response to treatment of 
the cervical deformities. Uh, one thing we really are excited to uh, look into is ligament biology and response to injury and healing uh, in this condition, as well as bone coupling and uncoupling and potential response to therapy as well. So uh, a lot of research is starting to be underway, but uh, we hope to have more answers in the next uh, few years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, going over to David. David, do you have any questions? Okay, and uh, moving on to call in user number four, which I believe is Sam. Do you have any questions? Hi there, yes. Just wanted to thank you as well for this very informative session. I'm very specific to cardiovascular status in these patients. Um, sometimes they will come with an echo before their um, surgery. And I'm just wondering, are there any aortic root dimensions that we should be looking for as red flags um, that these patients might be at higher risk for rupture that we should maybe have in the back of our head that they might not tolerate an anesthetic? Is there anything that sort of uh, specific um, characteristics that we should be looking out for? Yeah. Uh, in uh in a patient with very severe outward features of Lowy's Dietz syndrome, for example, with craniosynostosis and cleft palate, um, you know, I would be really concerned about uh, va a vascular event even at a very young age, in the, mm. you know, even less than a year of age. Um, aortic dimensions, uh, you know, we, we know more about how to interpret risk in correlation with aortic dimensions for Marfan syndrome. Given the new appreciation of this condition, there are some broad rules, um, but not great rules. Um, I think that uh, it, it is important uh, to standardize the aortic measurement to age and body size, and uh, there are nomograms available to do that. I know on the National Marfan Foundation website, and perhaps um, those will are or will be included on the Lowy's Dietz Syndrome website. Um, but you know, I, I would. Uh, in any child that's very severely affected, um, I would get a, a dedicated assessment by a, a pediatric cardiologist that's very familiar with this condition. Um, for more typically affected individuals, I think you can feel comfortable if the aortic root measurement um, is less than about three and a half centimeters. Um, between three and a half and four centimeters, again, I think a, a very dedicated cardiovascular evaluation should be done um, to determine if, if the patient's in good shape for surgery. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, Sam, thank you very much for that question. And I'm going to go to Andrea. Any questions? No, thank you very much again. Okay, terrific. So um, it looks like we don't have any other questions. I'm going to just uh, open it up to uh, Peter, Hal, and Paul. Uh, do you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, Peter? Well, no. I, uh, as so many people have said, this is this has really been outstanding. Yeah, I, and I, I want to again thank Hal and Hal and Paul for taking the time to uh, to do this uh, fine educational event this evening. I'm still committed to doing my part as the CMO for the organization to make sure that those who are unable to participate this evening have an opportunity, A, to, if they have the time, to to actually watch the presentation. So I appreciate the fact, Joseph, that you um, recorded it. The other thing that I would ask you, you know, when we were together in POSNA, you gave me a, a you know, a coil-bound uh, uh, kind of handouts, so Lowy Dietz syndrome, encourage education, foster research, provide support, and then, and then a number of one sheet things, a correct diagnosis, caring for cardiovascular problems, and so on. And I, you know, I'd certainly be quite prepared to, uh, if you had electronic copies of those, to distribute those out to the uh, 22 hospitals as well. Sure, be happy to. I'll arrange to get you that as well, uh, Peter, uh, with the recording and the presentations from tonight. So thank you. Perfect. For that. Appreciate that very much. Um, Hal and uh, any and Paul, anything you'd like to add? I'd just like to thank everyone for participating and for um, demonstrating their eagerness to learn more about this condition. You know, the only other thing I'd add is that uh, sometimes I'm contacted by physicians 
who have a subtle suspicion and they almost feel timid about uh, asking. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always thrilled uh, that people are maintaining a high index of suspicion. And, uh, and I think the right rule to live by is uh, if there's any doubt, uh, push the issue forward. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for being interested in, in this condition. Thank you, Hal. Hal, would you mind if, if included in the material that we send out uh, your your appropriate contact information? Oh, that would be that would be uh, fine. That would be great. Good. Thank you. I'll take care of that as well. Thank you, um, Paul. Well, thanks everybody for all your questions. Uh, I always learn a lot by doing these things and uh, listening to Hal. So, uh, <laughs> thank you everybody for. Uh, for participating and stimulating this discussion. You know, it was neat uh, because it, it really was a multidisciplinary uh, group. So we had uh, some PD pods, some uh, anesthesiologists, a plastic surgeon, one of our burn surgeons, and uh, one of our radiologists. So I'm, I'm thrilled with the with the distribution. Thank you. It's terrific. Um, Gretchen, are you still there with Hal? Is there anything you'd like to mention or say? Oh, just um, again, thank everyone, and please feel free to contact the foundation um, info at louisgeeks.org or myself for any questions or concerns, or please direct patients if they're looking for more inf information to the foundation. Thank you, Gretchen. And, and I just want to reiterate that to everybody, that to the whole medical community. The foundation, our role is to provide information uh, not only to the patients, but also to the medical professionals. And we get a lot of calls from families that are really at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. And they ask us, you know, where do I go? Who do I go see? So we, uh, we try to plug them into doctors that uh, are familiar with the disease and know how to treat it. Um, I can say from personal experience that the team at Hopkins has been very receptive, um, starting to when I reached out to Gretchen on Christmas Eve 2009, and I was a you know, distraught parent, uh, right up to uh, Paul and Hal uh, making themselves available. So. Um, I can tell you that uh, it's a fantastic core team that is uh, very supportive and very committed to helping everybody, whether it's patients or really medical professionals. So I'd like to say thank you very much. Peter, I'd like to thank you very much for organizing this. I, uh, Peter, I know you were on vacation. I don't think it's true because you I probably got 20 emails back from you on your vacation, so I'm not sure <laughs> that it was your vacation or what, but thank you very much for the responsiveness and the support and all of your staff, in particular Donna, who helped me uh, put this together. And um, Hal and Paul, thank you very much, and Gretchen, for uh, taking the time tonight. I know it's family time, and I know it's also holiday time, so thank you very much for that. Um, sure. I will uh, undertake, Peter, to make sure that you get the spiral bound presentation, which is the medical presentation, the fact sheets, also the uh, checklist that gives you all the different attributes that you should look at, as well as these presentations, uh, Dr. Uh, Dietz's uh, contact information, and the recording so that you can distribute that internally. Perfect. All right, um, so Perfect. I'd like to say thank you to everybody. I would uh, just ask uh, Paul, Hal, and Peter to stay on the line, and if everybody else, uh, if you're good to go, you can just disconnect, and I wish everybody a good evening. Thank you very much. So uh, for our presenters, if you just stay on the line for two seconds, please. And uh, our uh, guests are just dropping off. I'm gonna stop the recorder now.